Okay, so we're running a hypothesis testing procedure. On this claim, the mean is greater than four. In this video, we're looking at the data and the test statistics steps. Okay, so uh, remember that this was the mean time to complete a bachelor's degree. We said it was greater than four years in the claim. We had a pair of competing hypotheses were created from that. Here, this one says that the null hypothesis is that the mean time to complete a bachelor's is less than or equal to four years versus the mean time is greater than four years. That creates two different sets of possibilities, right, that are distinct and mutually exclusive. Then um, we would have had some data from a study somewhere along the way that says a recent study found that there were 32 uh, recent college graduates with bachelor's degree. Among that sample, 32 randomly selected uh, students with bachelor's degrees. The average time to complete that degree was 5.1 years, and the standard deviation for that group was 1.1 years. What we want to do with this information is figure out how we can come up with a um, sort of a summary of this data, something that encapsulates the idea of whether this data supports this uh, HA claim or whether it's uh, in the camp that belongs to HO. So let me try to explain this uh, without getting too much into the theory because we're going to talk about the theory in the next video where we speak about um, why we make certain decisions along the way. But um, without getting into that too heavily, because we just want to basically make sure that you understand the general concept first, and as we do the problems, we'll discuss some of that more later. But what we want to look at here is the difference between HO and HA. Let's say that there's no way to finish a college degree faster than zero years. So we'll say that this set is essentially the length the set from zero years up until four years inclusive, right? And then, so this is the possible, with, under this hypothesis, these are the possible values that the mean could take on. And then look at this one. This one would be from four, right? Not including four, up to infinity, right? Could take you forever and ever and ever and ever finish the degree. Um, of course, that number is not a number, it's a concept, right? All right, now let's uh, look at these two sets. Essentially, you can say that um, they're closest together if this mean from this hypothesis was truly four. So if the real population mean was really four, it'd be right on the border between this set and this set. And then what would happen is, is that um, we'd be more likely in that scenario, we have the most probability of getting values from the sample study that would be higher than four, right? Because you know, imagine if the real mean was two. You might get values around two, right? But they probably would never get as high as four and probably never get past that point so that you would think maybe that HA is correct, right? But if the real mean was four, and not something like two, but rather it was something right at the edge of that set, it could be that when you get values of X bar that fluctuate, that aren't exactly the same as the population mean, they sometimes might be a little higher, right? Just like if you had a study of male heights, a sample study might show that the average height is five foot nine and a half, or maybe the real number is five foot eight and a half or something. So if that would happen, then you, know, you could expect that kind of variation perhaps, right? Because the sample, uh, mean is you know, something that fluctuates, right? It has sampling error. So, same thing, if we had the population mean being truly four years, sometimes, you know, you might get a sample where it's a little higher than that. And when it's a little higher, you might think, or might be tempted to think, that HA is true. And so the hardest uh, scenario for us to distinguish between HO and HA is when the mean here would take on this value in this set, right? If HO is in fact true, in other words. If HO is true and the real value that it is, that the mean is, is four, it's going to be difficult to distinguish between HO and HA, or at least the most difficult, I would say, right? In other words, we're more likely to commit a mistake when the mean here is four. Let's keep that in mind, because we're going to discuss that in the next video, that if we had that number, we'd be most likely to commit a mistake in that scenario. So, all right, good. Having said that, then maybe you'll understand now or later why we make this test statistic formula up, we're going to be looking at this number here. Okay, so here is the test stat formula. We're going to start out with the first part, x bar minus mu sub zero. If you look at what this is doing, the first part of the test stat formula, we're going to compare what we observe from the sample to what we hypothesize about in HO. That subscript sub zero is pointing us to HO, and it's asking us to take the value that we see here in the hypothesis. Remember, there's a set of values, right? But we're going to take that number that we see, because that's the number at the very end of that set. We're going to put that number there. We're going to assume that that number is the true mean. And under that assumption, we're going to see how that compares to this value of x bar. Very simple. If they're 
very close to one another, right? Then what that says, like in other words, if we subtract these two numbers and we get a very small difference, what it's basically saying is what? That what we see in the real world is very similar to what we hypothesized was true, right? So what we actually observe in the reality is actually very similar to what we thought was true about reality. That's if they're very close to one another. For example, if their difference was zero, it means that what we saw and what we thought we'd see are exactly the same. If they're not, if it's not zero, then it means there's a difference, right? And a difference is likely to happen, even if this guy is true, right? Because we know this guy fluctuates. But here's the thing. When we see a big difference, we start to think about, gee, if there's a big difference between what we observe in reality versus what we think is true about reality, then maybe there's something wrong with this guy. Because we certainly wouldn't question reality as much as we would somebody's opinion, right? Somebody's opinion or theory or statement could be wrong. We use empirical evidence, right? Data derived from reality, and we trust it more than we trust somebody's just opinion, right? Okay, now, all that sounds great except for one problem. Uh, we talked about this distance just in absolute terms, you know, how far apart they are. Um, but, of course, we know that that distance is dependent upon something, right? This standard error, right? The standard deviation. Not the standard, this is the standard deviation, but it's related to this and this, right? So the idea is that um, this x bar will vary. It has a standard error, right? In other words, it varies, right? It doesn't always come out to be the same number when you take a sample of 32. For a thousand samples of 32, you're very likely to get a thousand unique x bars, different x bars. What we're interested in is how did this guy vary, and is the difference between this guy and this guy unusual with respect to that variation? In other words, again, assuming that this guy is in fact true, then the sample value should be, in theory, equal to that, right? But of course, we know that it's going to vary, so it's not going to be exactly equal to that. But we know that its mean, according to the central limit theorem, should be the population mean, so that on average, this guy and this guy are the same. We know that for a specific instance of x bar, it probably is not going to be the same. But we expect that the difference from this guy and this guy shouldn't be too many standard errors away from the true value, right? So, in other words, if we assume these guys to be the same, then their difference should be something small, right? With respect to the sampling error for x bar. That's a lot of theory, but here's basically what we're saying. It's like saying we're going to figure out the number of standard deviations this value is away from what's supposed to be its mean, right? So, that would be sigma divided by the square root of n. That's the standard error for x bar that we learned in the central limit theorem. Now basically what this is, is a z-score formula. We've used that formula before. What is it doing? It's taking a difference between what we saw in reality and what we hypothesized to be true, and then we're dividing it by the standard error for x-bar, right? Because we know x-bar will vary. We want to see if this is an unusual difference in light of that. Now how do we know if it's unusual? Well, of course, if it comes out to be a number that's pretty extreme for a z-score, we'll assume that it's an unusual number of standard deviations away from its supposed center, right? Let's calculate that for this particular problem. So in that case, we would have x bar being 5.1 minus the hypothesized mean, which is 4, divided by sigma, which is 1.1, over the square root of 32. And if we do all that, let's see what we get. So the top, of course, becomes 1.1. So let's divide 1.1 divided by 1.1 again divided by the square root of 32, right? So again, the difference between uh, 5.1 and 4 is 1.1, and then we also happen to have the same standard error there, right? Just pure luck, right? Okay, and when we're done there, we end up with this number. We get a number of 5.66 standard errors above this value. So this number here is 5.66, or 5. Uh, or almost six standard errors above this value here. Now let's think about this carefully. If this was actually the population mean value, if it really was, then x bar's average value would be that guy, right? So he should be somewhere around this number. If that were true, this would be a highly unusual sample set of data. It would be very unlikely that we get an x bar value this high, because this is almost six standard deviations above the mean that it's supposed to be at. That's extremely rare. We know z-scores above 2 and 3 start to become rare, right? So we know that that, being almost 6, is very rare. And that tells us there might be something wrong. 
That means there might be some discrepancy between these two numbers. They're pretty different. If they're pretty different, we're going to say the problem is here, because that comes from the hypothesis, it comes from the theory, as opposed from the actual sample data, real-world data, right? And then we're going to discuss what that consequence is later, but essentially it would mean that we're thinking maybe he's wrong, right? That he's no good. And if he's no good, then it basically means we're saying this guy is good. That would be the consequence, right? Because only one of them can be right. If that one's wrong, then this one must be right, which means that the claim is also in that case correct as well. And we won't use that loose language of right and wrong because then we know there's a chance we could make a mistake. And that's going to lead us to our next video, which has two important components. The first component in that video is going to be to discuss how we make that decision when it's a little closer, right? Like we could probably all agree that's pretty extreme. That means there must be something wrong with this hypothesis, right? But what if it's not so extreme? What if it was 1.56? What if it was 1.69? Is that far enough above its supposed average for us to say we should, you know, support this HA over this HO? Is that enough? Well, I don't know. We have to have some cutoff, some place where, well, when this number is at a certain place, we will say that we should um, reject this HO guy, say he's no good, and therefore support the other one. And uh, that's the next thing, to figure out how to make that decision. That's going to be called the critical value when we do that. And then lastly, um, if, while we talk about that critical value, we're going to be talking about um, the logic of, hey, we don't... We can't say this is right, this is wrong, necessarily, just because we have one sample study that says that that's the case. It turns out that, of course, there's always going to be a probability that we could make a mistake. We're going to discuss that possibility. Like, for example, the idea that maybe it really is for the mean, but yet, somehow, we got a sample set of data like this. It could happen, right? Random samples are just that. They're random samples. And every now and again, a random sample turns out to be very strange or unique. That can happen. There's some small probability of it. And so the question is, we want to talk about later is, you know, what's the proper wording that we should use then to say this is right and this is wrong? Do we want to say that that strongly, or do we want to use something that's a little more gentle so we can say, well, hey, we might be wrong ourselves, so we're going to say something maybe like, the data here supports this, right? And the data here makes it look like we should reject this idea. Okay. Anyways, we'll talk more about that in the next video.